My mom has a permanently stuck in the 80s thing. We're talking teased up feathered hair, acid wash denim jacket, and shoulder pads. So many shoulder pads. But I just got a new phone from AT&T. And check this out. I got a second phone to gift my mom. So now she can finally ditch her old one for a phone that can actually stream all the 80s shows she loves. Come into an AT&T store and find out how to get a smartphone on us. AT&T. More for your thing. That's our thing. See store for details. I'm not the house of cards that falls down easily. Oh, I'm strong enough to handle what you throw at me. Welcome to Mental Health News Radio. I'm your host, Kristen Sunanta Walker. Just what are we going to discuss? The intimacy that is mental health. Let's continue to make it as comfortable as discussing brain health or heart health. This show has been on the air for several years and we have amazing co-hosts. And then we created a network of podcasters on mentalhealthnewsradionetwork.com, a place where every possible facet of mental well-being can be talked about openly. My show, after several hundred interviews, the format is this, intimate, deep, funny, touching, sometimes uncomfortable, but always vulnerable conversations with interesting people. The goal is to have you, our listening family, many of you who have become my good friends, feel as though you are listening in on private conversations. Thank you for tuning in and becoming part of this amazing journey with me and now with our network of podcasters. Just knowing this podcast might be helping any of you realize you are not alone on this journey called being a human being makes doing this podcast worth every second. Hi everyone, Kristen Sinanto Walker here. I'm really excited about our next guest and you'll understand why in a moment. Let me give you a little bit about her background and then she'll expand from there. Dr. Susan J. Lewis is a mental health professional and she's also licensed psychologist, forensic psychologist, and an attorney. So that's a, um, a three, a, what is that called? A triple threat. Susan, thank you so much for, <laughs> for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So tell our listeners a little bit more about your background and I'll, I'll preface it with this. We have so many listeners that are in the mental health field, either they're just starting out or they, maybe they're switching gears. And so they really like to hear why you chose to be in this field. So when you're giving us more about your background, please tell us too why this became your career path. Sure. I think the thing that started me was um, I was in therapy when I was in college and I very much admired my therapist. And I think what she did was that she gave me her love of psychology. And that's why I pursued it. Early on, after I got my PhD, um, I spent years doing clinical work. And at the end of that period of time, uh, I was working in a a unit in Massachusetts that was called the Dangerous to Manage Unit. And it was a unit that housed 18 men that were too difficult, uh, too violent to be housed on an ordinary unit, if you will. And downstairs, because there were two floors, was a forensic unit. And so I began to do forensic evaluations, which I really enjoyed. As often happens today in mental health, the contract shifted. And I didn't like the new people who came in. And so now I have to ask the question, what is it that I'm going to be when I grow up? (laughs) And I haven't grown up yet but I've answered that question. (laughs) Um, I applied for a clinical fellowship in forensic psychology at Harvard's Harvard's Mass General Hospital and went there to study for a year. And it was actually quite, quite fun. We used to call it serial killer school. Um, After I finished that, I um, didn't know what I was going to do with my life. And I had a supervisor there who I thought was just brilliant, who was a PhD JD, who suggested that I should go to law school. Uh, He thought I might enjoy it. And I thought, well, you know, that's as good an idea as any. (laughs) Uh, So I went on to get my law degree. And and after that, I worked in a women's prison. Uh, I was the manager of a program for female sex offenders. 
And that was a changing point for me, I think. It was such deep and moving work. Um, so I've been in clinical practice a very long time. Um, I usually consult with area attorneys if there are issues around mental health and the law, mm -hmm. uh, state of mind at the time of the crime, uh, whether someone can go ahead and be tried in a court of law. Now, what I do now is I travel around the United States and I give seminars, uh, law and ethics for mental health professionals that are specifically designed for the state that I'm in. What happened was I moved from Massachusetts to Colorado. Now, I'm an East Coast girl. So <laughs> what do I know? But when I got to Colorado, one of the things that struck me, there's no air. <laughs> right. So now what I'm going to do? And so I decided to sit down. That way it won't affect me. And so I've done <laughs> some writing while I've been out here. It's yeah, been effective. You've got two books, Legal and Ethical Issues for Mental Health Clinicians, Best Practices for Avoiding Litigation, Complaints, and Malpractice, and then From Deep with a Forensic and Clinical Psychologist Journey. And they're completely different books. I know they're both in the mental health field, but um, I know so many mental health professionals that get into relationships. I didn't know I was going to take the conversation in this direction, but whatever. I'll pretend I'm in Colorado and the air is affecting me too. Um, <laughs> I've, I have so many mental health professionals because a favorite topic today is uh, personality disorders. Many of them will get into treatment with someone who is a, has a personality disorder and that isn't their specialty. And then they are blasted with this person and they don't know how to defend themselves. They don't know how to get this person to go to someone else who would better serve them without causing some kind of narcissistic injury and where the legal <laughs> ethics come into play. And, you know, they're 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 terrified. So it's been really interesting to hear that. And it's not something they're going to talk about publicly, obviously, but um, it's been interesting <laughs> to sort of take a back seat to that and see that is a difficult position. I mean, I, I know a few that have been stalked by their patients um, when they mm -hmm. try to put up boundaries and what a, what a, what a difficult position to be in. What are your thoughts on all of that? I've never been stalked. Thank goodness. The, I think that when someone is looking for a therapist, one of the things you're doing is you're, is you're deciding whether or not you are uh, compatible. And there's a period of time, I think, when uh, the patient and the therapist gets to know each other. I don't think that that period of time should go on too long if it's not a match. And I think one of the things that uh, that assists with is people don't get so engaged that it becomes so difficult for them to leave and to find someone else. Right. That, do that doesn't mean they won't be angry. But I think it's important not to engage someone until they've made a decision. Interesting. How about the, you know, there there have been situations where they are being stalked. Uh, the patient is very angry. They are very upset at their therapist for, you know, trying to get them to a different space and they are not really being supported by the practice that they're in because they should quote unquote know better. And this reality is, you know, therapists are people and they study different specialties and sometimes personality disorders can catch you completely off guard. And if that's not your area of specialty, can be very difficult to even know what just hit you. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I agree with you. Um, for myself, with my all my experience, I expect myself very early on to do two things. One is to be able to make a uh, clinical diagnosis that I would share with a client, and then to be able to describe a little bit about what my thoughts are uh, about what it is that they need. I've never been stalked. Um, I don't know if that's a compliment or an insult. <laughs> but um, I think that if you um, don't have an expertise in something, that there's nothing wrong with saying that. Right. And that, in fact, uh, in my opinion, um, it's practicing below the standard of care. 
right. if you are seeing someone and you really don't have the expertise to help them. Right. I, exactly. I believe that I should own that. And that sometimes comes with age and, um, and practice. So a new therapist starting out, I can't even, I can't even imagine <laughs> how you navigate that path. Are you insinuating I'm old? <laughs> hey, <laughs> uh, I just made a reference to Donny Osmond and his purple socks the other day and went, oh, I really just doubted myself. So, yeah. <laughs> well, what I, I think there's certain, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, 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 you go right ahead. I There are um, many things that you don't learn in school. Right. And. One of them, I think, is what it means to develop a relationship, helping relationship with a client and how you do that and how you learn to meet the client where they are as opposed to where you want them to be. Right. You said something about old old age helps that. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) it helps so many things. We think it's such a hindrance and it's actually a wonderful thing. You said something about um, how deep and profound the work was working with female sex offenders. Explain what you meant by that and and why that was so moving to you. What what I well what I realized is that um, society is not interested in uh, noting that there are female sex offenders. Right. I think the thing that moved me the most uh, was one client in particular who had just a horrendous background, sexual abuse. She was abused by her husband, abused by her mother. It was just a very tragic story. And uh, had a very, very long sentence. Uh, and I did some work with her. And the thing that I was so impressed and so touched by was that going to prison for her meant she was free. Mm-hmm. And she was really able to take on and talk about what her life was like and what she wanted her life to be. She left it up to her children as to whether or not they wanted to have a relationship with her uh, because she was charged with rape, rape of, of her children. I was just so impressed with her sensitivity and her willingness to face very, very serious, uh, very traumatizing issues. It's just so impressive to me. In fact, uh, she was uh, my hero. And Mm. that's actually what what started me writing my book. Interesting. Have you ever had anyone be taken aback by you saying that someone that um, had these behaviors was your hero? taken aback by their by their negative possibly reaction to that statement that someone is a hero to me well that someone that does these things you would call a hero yes of course I believe that our mental health system has compromised care of individuals right and one of the things that Uh, has happened and continues to happen, I think, is a stigma around mental illness um, that people carry with them. And uh, for myself, I see people for who they are, who they can be. Uh, Just because someone has been involved in activities that may be abhorrent to someone else doesn't make them a bad person. And I think that if you can realize that and engage in a relationship with them, that makes the therapy and the healing very rich. Right. It's a very different seat. And I guess what I want to say to our listeners that aren't therapists, it's a very different seat to sit in when you're treating someone and they're coming to you for help for these behaviors that you might have been a victim of a person like this, but you're not a therapist and your job is not to help them. Your job is to keep yourself safe from their behavior. So there's so many different hats that come into play and we get a lot of bombastic reactions. Sometimes Um, we had a gentleman who came on, who was one of the worst domestic violence offenders 
in the state of Arizona, I believe, but he's, you know, he served his time and he spent 20 some years in domestic violence centers, teaching women about his behavior from the past. And we had some pretty upset people that we, I would even have him on my show. And I thought, Mm -hmm. oh, you know, we don't understand why and where and how, even in our pain, I was molested by my father. My father was a rageaholic and yet I can apply compassion to people that I also understand his childhood. So it's, uh, it's, it's very different from the victim's side to the perpetrator who was also a victim at some point. Does that make any sense? Mm-hmm. Or did I wind down a road that went to nowhere? <laughs> it, it, does, it does make sense. I once worked with a woman who uh, murdered her two, two children. And uh, before I started working with her, I was charged with doing a forensic evaluation. I wondered to myself, how am I going to do this? You know, I have all of these judgments that I'm going to be making. How am I going to be non-biased? And what I found was that she's a human being the same way I am, the same way you are. And there were reasons for it. The behavior was horrendous. That didn't make her a horrible, horrible person. There are spaces that people grow up in that are horrible. Right. And since there's such a stigma around mental illness, it's very difficult for people sometimes to go for help. And going for help is very, very painful. Yes. Yes, it is. And especially if you have no support whatsoever for doing those things. I always wonder, what is that tipping point? Why did my father, who had a horrible childhood, very abused, why did he become a predator? And why didn't I when he abused me? And um, I don't think it's because I'm some kind of a better person or stronger spirit or whatever. I just... I don't have an explanation for that. So where do you, and I'm not a therapist, so where do you sit with with that? You know, why some people go that direction and some people don't? You know, I think history repeats itself. And I think that generally um, there's no information around. And so people don't know. For example, someone grows up in a very disorganized family for whatever reasons, and they become an adult. And one of the things that happens is their life is disorganized. Their relationships are disorganized. They can't support themselves. They can't hold on to jobs. If they had an opportunity to look backward and to find out a little bit about how their history has affected the here and the now, then they have an opportunity to change. Mm. But you have to be able to understand what has happened change behavior. Yeah, absolutely. And well, digging out compassion sometimes, especially when you've been a victim of these behaviors is very difficult and very personal. Mm -hmm. I I don't have to condone, you don't have to condone the behavior. Right. And I'm sure that there's a lot of hatred for the perpetrator. That doesn't make them not treatable. Right. I know, I know, no one likes commercials, but seriously, folks, without the help from these organizations, we could not stay on the air. Please give a shout out to zencharts.com. If you're a mental health or addiction treatment center, you'll want to use their EHR. It's gorgeous, and they're just good people. And also my genetics, M-Y-G-E-N-E-T-X.com, because knowing your genetic code empowers your mental health treatment. And lastly, copenotes.com. We love getting positive messages right to our phones every day from Johnny Crowder. He's the lead singer of Prison, a heavy metal band sharing their music about suicide prevention, addiction recovery, and mental health. See, that was painless. Support them as they support us. Back to the show. And to find the nugget of compassion in there and uh, human spirit and all of those things. Mm-hmm. How was it for it's you? Not always, um, it's not always so easy. Right. <laughs> yeah. 
How was it for you? And I'm not going to turn this into a feminist show, but I am curious. How was it for you as a female doing this and, and being in, in this profession at the time that you're, you've are you been in it? When I started out? Yeah. Well, it was during a, a, a period of time when, for the most part, women didn't go for their PhDs. Right. There was some prejudice, I think. Uh, one of the things I noticed um, after I got my PhD is the men had a hard time calling me Dr. Lewis. Hmm. Um, and so that was very easy. I just corrected them. <laughs> How did they respond <laughs> to you correcting then, them? You know, tell it, tell it how it is. Um, over time, I think it has changed. Uh, I think it used to be that just generally men became forensic psychologists. You know, I think psychology has opened up tremendously. But that doesn't mean the stigma has gone away. Right. I don't think. When you're when you're determining competence to stand trial, can you expand on what that means? Sure. Um, competency actually is a legal term. It has nothing to do with someone's the, the symptoms that they're experiencing it has been, nothing to do in large part with um mental illness it has to do with the defendant's state of mind during the criminal proceedings not during the commission of the crime does that make sense yeah it does it does it has nothing okay. to do with someone's competency level in terms of how their intelligence or you know no, right, right. And so what competency is in a court of law, um, it has to do with whether the, as we call them, respondent, understand the criminal charges. Do they understand the implications of being a defendant? Uh, do they understand something about the adversarial nature of a, a courtroom? They need to understand the uh different roles and responsibilities of those people in the courtroom. For example, what's the difference between a prosecutor and a defense attorney? What does a judge do? What does a jury do? They need to understand certain terms um, in the court, uh, such as a plea bargain, and they have to be able to work with their attorney to relate to them pertinent information and to make decisions, important decisions along the way that are in their best interest. Mm. that's pretty much what competency is criminal responsibility is a little different let's talk about what that is uh, criminal responsibility is at the time of the crime it's almost an, an autopsy of where someone was mentally at the time it's criminal responsibility in and of itself in different states uh, they have different rules. So, for example, in Texas, the test that they use is called the McNaughton test. Whether or not the uh, person understood that the nature of their crime was the difference between right from wrong. Uh, there are other ways to take a look at it, um, which has to do with a little bit more expansive, um, whether or not the individual's conduct as a result of the mental illness or mental defect, um, lack the capacity either to really appreciate and understand the wrongfulness of their conduct or to conform their conduct to the requirements of the law. So, for example, let's say that uh, someone is hearing voices in their head and the voices in their head are commanding them to commit some kind of crime. The question that you need to answer is, at the time of that crime, was the person uh, suffering from a mental disease so that it interfered in their capacity to know that what they were doing was wrong mm. and to understand the law and say, oh, wait a minute, I can't do this. So it's very, very different. How do you determine, okay, um, I'm thinking about a, a somewhat recent situation that I heard about where it's a mental health issue to a couple, volatile relationship, extremely volatile relationship, uh, domestic abuse on both sides, but the but only one of them 
uh, ended up getting charged and kind of taking the brunt of, of the blame for it. And then you bring in, you know, mental health issues, bipolar disorder, whatever, you know, whatever the mental health issues were, lack of proper treatment, medication, whatever they are. And what was interesting was to watch or to, you know, hear about this, to uh, see in the heat of a prison sentence or in the heat of criminal charges, even worse behavior, even worse acting out because of the fear of, you know, the consequences of their actions. How do you navigate that when you're dealing with someone who, you know, those fears are very real. Yes, they've done something wrong and that's why they're in this situation, but you're dealing with mental illness. You're also dealing with fear and you're dealing with someone who made a very bad decision or two people who made bad decisions. Um, How do you kind of navigate that with a, with a patient so that they're prepared for serving their sentence? Well, I don't know that anyone is ever prepared for serving a sentence. It's not as if prison is the most fun place to go to. Right, exactly. <laughs> you know, I think that that piece is very pragmatic in some ways, and it is the responsibility of the attorney mm. to explain to the client, if you plead guilty, these may be the consequences. Well, you have an op- the option to make a plea bargain if the prosecutor will accept it. These are, the, these are going to be the consequences of, for example, pleading in some particular way. I think it's the responsibility of the attorney. In terms of the feelings that someone may have uh, at the time that the decisions are made, um, I think the way that our mental health system interacts with our legal system is at that time, there's kind of a divorce. Yes. And I, you know, I don't know whether anyone can ever be helped um, in terms of going to prison, but there is, you know, the difference between being a forensic psychologist and a clinical psychologist, you know, it's, it's a marriage. And often because forensic psychology is legal in nature, there needs to be marriage counseling so they can work together. Right. So I'm not sure that there's any way that anyone would be peaceful about going to prison. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, no. And I wouldn't want to take a vacation doing that. That would not be my top choice. No, absolutely not. <laughs> So when you're working with, um, have you had a situation where, and I'm sure you have, but I'm going to ask the question anyway, where you are working with someone who um, has uh, behaved like a predator and you're also working with the victim of that person and you're trying to navigate healing within that relationship? Mm -hmm. Am I a a forensic psychologist? Am I in that role? Either, either as a licensed psychologist, a forensic psychologist, or as an attorney that knows about mental mm-hmm. health. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you're a forensic psychologist, you don't enter into a treatment relationship with someone. You can't be independent and without bias if you enter into a treatment relationship with them, mm-hmm. because treatment relationships are uh, made up of being able to understand someone, being able to help them heal. That's not my job as a forensic psychologist. I know it sounds a little harsh. As a forensic psychologist, my job job is either to do a competency evaluation or criminal responsibility evaluation. And whatever my findings are, to present those findings to the court. Mm. But I, it's unethical for me to also be the clinician. Right. Well, that's good. So our, no, so our listeners know the difference between the two, because I don't know that many people know the difference between forensic psychology and clinical psychology. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the interesting piece to me is that you've got these three different pieces. So you wear these three different hats and they are very different. How do you um, sustain your sanity with (laughs) those very different (laughs) hats that you have to wear? My sanity, huh? Okay. (laughs) Relatively (laughs) speaking. (laughs) So given that question, my assumption is that you you assume that I'm sane. (laughs) I make no assumptions. (laughs) 
<laughs> I think that that with experience you learn to do that. Uh, you learn the difference between a forensic psychologist, what their roles and responsibilities are, and the set, which is very different than a clinician. Um, the forensic psychologist makes uh, an evaluation, an independent evaluation, collects all of the data, and then presents the data to the court. It is the judge in the court that makes an adjudication around competency or criminal responsibility. So it's very different. It's a legal proceeding. Right. Where clinically, I'm sitting down with someone. I want to know what, what it is that ails them, why they have decided to seek out some help. And the focus for me is on developing a relationship with them from wherever they start. It has nothing to do with any court proceedings. And as an attorney, um, sometimes they don't have any empathy. <laughs> so... Right. What they do takes place within the court of law. It is simply what we call black letter law. There are law- laws and you have to follow them. Right. That's what I've found interesting. You know, being a CEO, I've, I've definitely had people, I've been doing this a long time. So, of course, I'm going to run into different interesting situations. But I've definitely had people that have messed up royally um, and they somehow lay the feet uh, or lay at my feet uh, that I'm going to save them from whatever behavior they've done that's possibly criminal. And uh, and I'm heartless because I don't listen to their them plead their case. And I think, oh my gosh, <laughs> go you think uh, go sit in front of a judge who's heard this a thousand times mm-hmm. and hear what the law actually is and hear that it's uh, your tears are certainly valid, but they don't really, they're not going to get you anywhere here. It's just fascinating to me, the level at which people won't take responsibility for their own behavior and their own actions and really try to, you know, play hot potato with that, with anyone that they can attach themselves to. Well, if you've done something really horrible, really, really horrible to Admit to yourself that you have engaged in that behavior is, I think it breaks people. Yeah. It's a big responsibility to take. It's much easier to blame. Right. And the situation, the problem with blaming, and first of all, it's a protective mechanism. But the problem with blaming is when you blame someone else. Uh, you shift the locus of control. So you don't have to take responsibility for anything, which means you don't have the opportunity to change and to grow and to look at uh, where you came from, where you want to go to, what happened. Because now you blame someone else or you blame it on society. So it's yeah. no easy task to take responsibility. It isn't. And I always think, um, you know, I, f- I have definitely have friends. I'm in the mental health field who have been in prison, family members who have, and seeing what they, how they behave when they're in the boiling water that they put on the stove themselves is very interesting. Most, well, anyone that's been my friend has just, you know, had their drama about it. And then, you know what? I did this. I'm going to suck it up and deal with the consequences of what I've done. And I'm not going to try to take eight people down with me uh, because, you know, because I need to allay blame somewhere else. So it's, it's been interesting to sort of watch the end to see other people that they're just not ready to take responsibility for their behavior. Even something as profound as a prison sentence isn't enough for them to get it. And to get to that place, which to me is their freedom. The moment that you take responsibility for what you have done and really take responsibility for it, therein lies your freedom, in my personal opinion. Yeah, it sets you free. I've done a lot of work with evaluating uh, male sex offenders for sexually violent predator status. And one of the things that that I've seen fairly often is. Uh, individuals 
will say, I didn't do that. I would never do anything like that. When they have been sentenced for doing that, right? they don't have the ability to change. What about ones that will say, I did that, but they are still trying to con their way out of taking responsibility for what they did. But boy, they'll tell you they did it and they sound so believable. How, how about mm-hmm. those types of situations? So how do they con you? Well, not that they're trying to con you. They're trying to um, lay responsibility somewhere else. They're, they really haven't taken responsibility for, for what they've done, even though there's the crocodile tears and, oh, I'm so sorry. But they're still trying to uh, get people to get them out of the mess that they're in instead of, mm-hmm. no, you messed up and you need to do your thing. People are manipulative. You know, you have to determine or I have to make a determination what's real and what isn't real. That's no easy task. I mean, I think clients lie to me all the time. Do you think I know that? Of course not. Right. But but you use your best clinical judgment. You try to the best of your ability to be kind and understanding and to recognize the limitations that an individual may have. Hmm. There's nothing that you can do about that. Right. Right, exactly. You are everyone. No. <laughs> we can, it's just just enough to try and cure ourselves. It's just enough to try and, you know, we can we can um, cure three quarters of the population, of course, but there'll be another quarter that we won't be able to, to help. Right. Um, you know, and there are different philosophies about how people practice and, uh, for example, the trauma. And essentially, I believe what has to happen is you have to find somebody who is the right fit, who you can develop a trusting relationship with, and will take the risk to um, look at some things that are extraordinarily painful and trust that the relationship and the trust in the relationship will sustain the person. I can't, the, the, the same thing that you said when we first started talking about how much you admired the person that you were um, receiving therapy from, that is the same reason why I love this profession. Just mm-hmm. uh, my parent, they were my healthy parents, mental health professionals. Mm-hmm. And um, such profound respect for someone and the responsibility to be told someone's innermost (laughs) secrets, fears, um, issues, behaviors, things they're so profoundly ashamed of, and to sit with that and hold safe space for someone to work through it is just incredible to me. And to be able to see someone who doesn't have any judgments around it. Yes. My my job is not to judge. I don't want to. I think it's harmful. And I think at this stage of my career, I've learned a little bit about myself. If I see someone that I'm concerned that I may pass my own personal judgment with, I'm not going to continue with them because that's not an equal and fair relationship. Right. So I expect myself to know what's going on with myself. Which takes your own deep examination and excavation. (laughs) That's the fun part. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And it never, the fun never ends. Let me tell you. (laughs) No, the fun never ends. I I believe that anybody that practices in our field should have had the experience of being in therapy themselves. I can't even help them understand. Yeah. Help them understand the nature of the relationship. And what it feels like to be on the receiving end. Right. I can't fathom going through life without having those relationships with therapists. And, you know, 90% of the people I know are therapists. And so they're also my friends. But um, I just, but they, I get outside of the behavioral health bubble and I realize, no, not everybody really cares or wants to go to therapy. Um, well, people are afraid. Right. I mean, if you think about it, 
who in their right mind wants to establish a relationship with a therapist that will enable you to talk about the most horrible things you've done or felt. Right. It's tough. Yes. So in your... To the best of, the best of my ability, I need uh, for that person to make it safe and okay. That has to happen before. So with your most recent book that was published just this May, From Deep with a Forensic and Clinical Psychologist Journey, what was the impetus for you to write this particular book? I've been very lucky in my life. I have seen many clients who have been willing to trust me and to tell me their uh, deeper secrets. And I have learned from them. And so the book uh, deals with a lot of those clients. It deals also with some forensic work and how difficult that is. And, you know, not everybody does a a crime that um, is splashed across the paper. Those people are important. And they have made me or enabled me, uh, I think, to be successful in my career. And I owe them a debt. Mm. And that debt is a book. Oh, I love that. Amazing. So what is next on the horizon other than talking about the book and (laughs) what do you have planned? Well, I'm going to um, become a better tennis player. (laughs) That's one piece. I've toyed with with writing another book about uh, women and the different roles that women take. The problem is I can't get past one page right now. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> It'll come when it's ready. <laughs> <laughs> right. That doesn't sound promising. Um, I am open to whatever comes my way. Uh, I am open to whatever it is that I can create for myself. I just want to be helpful. I want to be caring. Uh, I want to be uh, able to develop the relationships with people across the board that are satisfying for myself and for them. I'd like to be real. Mm. Well, shouldn't I think we that makes life. That? Well, I think it makes life worthwhile. Yes, it does. And it's the staring into your own abyss. And I'm misquoting a lot of people the way that I'm saying this, but um, staring into that, that's going to set you free. And yet that is the most terrifying thing to actually do. So if you, if you do it, the way that that shapes the rest of your life and how you feel about living is profoundly affected. As is the opposite. If right. you don't do it. You're right. So true. People change. They can change. Doesn't matter where they come from. They can change. Even the people that are in uh, the state hospitals that are so profoundly ill. I do believe that uh, if they weren't, subjected to the mental health system the way it is today, I think they can get better also. Right. They all have the opportunity to get better from our strength. Susan, thank you so much for coming on the show and talking about all of this with us. Really appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me. Absolutely. And listeners, if you want more information um, and you have a question for Dr. Susan Lewis, please email info at mhnrnetwork.com and we will make sure that she receives your questions and again thank you for tuning in every time we do a show passive aggressive but never without good intentions i heat up and act on my emotions thanks so much for listening to mental health news radio our podcast can be found on itunes stitcher and hundreds of other podcast apps or you can visit our website at mentalhealthnewsradio.com. If you have a question or would like to be a guest, become a podcaster on our network, or join the amazing organizations that help keep us on the air, please email us at info at mhnrnetwork.com. Get ready for that special goodbye from our resident therapy dog, Miles, and a special thanks to Emily Sohn for letting us use her incredible song, Cordial, for our podcast music. Listen to the full song on SoundCloud at emily.sonne. Don't be surprised when I don't hate on you. After all we promised, we'd be cordial. Sometimes in you I can fight it. Good boy. 
Hey folks, Dirk Bentley here. If you've seen one of my concerts, you know I'm all about energy. Performing, recording, traveling, being a husband and a father, it's a busy life, and I need to be 100% every day. So when my battery starts running low, I grab a sugar-free, vitamin-packed, five-hour energy shot. It tastes great, and it gets me back to 100% fast. Try it. It could work for your busy life, too. For more information, visit 5hourenergy.com. If you want to experience moments of joy, excitement, Yahoo! and satisfaction, visit the Honda Summer Spectacular event, where well-qualified buyers can get 1.9% APR on the 2018 Honda Accord, part of KBB.com's 2018 Best Overall Brand. Yahoo! You've just entered car buying bliss. See dealer for financing details based on 2018 branded matures from Kelly Blue Book. Visit KBB.com for information.